Wisdom is handmaiden of revelation. Faith denotes the art of hanging on to something. Grace is the voluntary, unrestrained, and unmerited favor that he shows to sinners and that, instead of the verdict of death, brings them righteousness and life. Holy is that which has been chosen and set apart by Yahweh, divested of its common character by special ceremonies, it has received character of its own and now lives in this new condition in accordance with laws prescribed for it. The cherubims have the power of an ox, the majesty of a lion, the speed of an eagle, and the intelligence of a human being. Man in his fallen state retains his substance or essence, but the moral qualities belonging to his nature were lost. A human being doesn't have or bear the image of God, but he is the image of God. God is the archetype of man. It is the task of Christian theology to point out this image of God in man's being in its entirety. The breath of life is the principle of life. The living soul is the essence of man. Adam's knowledge, though pure, was limited and capable of growth. He walked by faith, not by sight. He not only possessed intuitive knowledge, but also discursive knowledge. He knew the future only by special revelation. God couldn't have been able to become man if he hadn't first made man in his own image. He is the prophet who explains God and proclaims his excellencies. He is the priest who consecrates himself with all that is created to God as a holy offering. He is the king who guides and governs all things in justice and rectitude. All that is in God, his spiritual essence, his virtues and perfections, his imminent self-distinctions, his self-communication and self-revelation in creation finds its admittedly finite and limited analogy and likeness in humanity. The Jews used to say that God had collected the dust for the human body from all the lands of the earth. Thus man forms a unity of the material and spiritual world, a mirror of the universe, a connecting link compendium, the epitome of all nature, microcosm, and precisely on that account, also the image and likeness of God, his son and heir, a micro-divine being. Though the term church should be restricted to Christianity, it must never be forgotten that the religious bond is the strongest form of all human community. Because we are all image bearers of God, our relationship with God flows out to other human beings. The church is the communion of saints, the congregation of the faithful. For Reformed theology, the invisible church was characterized especially as the elect known only to God. The Reformed churches also paced holy living and church discipline as a key mark. While election is the foundation of the church, it only manifests itself in faith and good works. Church, as the people of God, must not be confused or identified with the eschatological notion of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is not organized on earth, the church is. The characteristic essence of the church is that it is the people of God, the realization of God's own electing love. It is true that the benefits of the kingdom, notably the gifts of the Holy Spirit, are given to the church on earth for the mission of God's people. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are distributed to believers to benefit others, to call men and women to faith in Christ. These gifts include both supernatural and natural gifts, natural gifts that have been heightened and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Another conceptual difficulty is that the church is both a living organism, gathered by the Holy Spirit and charismatically led, and at the same time an institution structured by a specific polity. Institution and organism are aspects of the visible church on earth, and both have an invisible spiritual background. The only resolution is to acknowledge that the old Adam that continues to exist in believers also doesn't belong to the church, and that the church is in a process of becoming. The true and full measure of the church's identity isn't achieved until the consummation. The church remains an article of faith, and the only standard by which the church can be judged is scripture itself. The true church really has only one mark, the word of God, which is variously administered and confessed in preaching, instruction, confession, sacrament, and life. The word and the word alone is truly the soul of the church. 
Even though there are unbelievers within a body of believers and there remains impure elements in doctrine or practice, this doesn't disqualify a church body altogether. A true church in an absolute sense is impossible on earth. For that matter, neither can a holy false church exist. To qualify for that description, it would no longer be a church at all. The real church in history isn't perfect but, rather, has an undeniably dark side to it. The church is rent asunder by schism and divisions, some going back to the apostolic era. At the same time it is a mistake to reject all diversity in the church. Breaking fellowship with the church is a serious matter, schism is sin. At the same time, we must be careful with the terms heresy and schism. The former breaks the unity of the church on matters of doctrine, the latter in fellowship of communion. The community of those who share in Christ and his benefits is called the church. Strictly speaking, therefore, one can only speak of the church within the boundaries of Christianity. Religion is more deeply rooted in the human heart than anything else. It is the immediate result of our being created in God's image and therefore radically integral to our nature. Priests instructed the people in God's law, performed the sacrifices, blessed the people on behalf of YHWH. Jesus is the anointed mediator who fulfills the office of prophet, priest, and king. All who are in communion with Christ are named Christian and anointed to be prophets, priests, and kings in him. 